Hello. Welcome to Dog Food with Catherine Abel, telling stories about dogs that feed the mind and spirit. Today's story is Silver Tony. There was a boy named Ebby, and true to his name, he went with the ebb and flow of life, no matter where it took him. Yesterday, his girlfriend of one year kicked him out and told him to take that dog she never wanted. It was understandable because she worked full-time and went to college part-time, while Ebby worked no time at all. Surely, a 25-year-old healthy, intelligent man should want to work, right? Wrong. Ebby found himself homeless and hungry and with a 40-pound silver pit bull puppy named Tony. They were living in his subcompact car that ran like a dream. Today, the second day of living in the car... Tony is in the back seat with a wide, frayed, dirty black collar around his neck. From it hangs a ridiculously heavy chain. Five feet of it is coiled on the floorboard. Tony is thrilled to be with Ebby, because though he's not really very nice, he's starved for attention and companionship and will take whatever he can get. He likes living in the car much better than living out under the tree. At least in the car, he won't get soaking wet when it rains and won't be so cold when the weather dips into the twenties. He doesn't know what it means to run or walk more than eight feet in any direction. The back seat is comfortable, and he likes it. He's trying his very best not to jump on and lick Ebby, but it's hard. He's a six-month-old puppy and filled with the energy of a jittery, unexercised, promising college athlete. The elbow he got in his face yesterday did not feel good. He just wanted to get between the seats and look at the road like Ebby was doing all the time. From the far left corner of the back seat, he's trying hard to keep his distance from Ebby while fighting the constant urge to show him how much he loves and appreciates him. Though every time he makes up his mind to move forward, the bruising on the right side of his face and eye reminds him to stay back and be quiet. Ebby pulls into the long driveway that winds up and down and finally around to the front of his father's three-bedroom brick ranch home. He stops the car and puts it in park. With both hands on the steering wheel, he takes a deep breath in and slowly lets it out. He looks into the rearview mirror and sees Tony, the dog he had to have, a pit bull, a dog he thought would make others think he was a big man. He feels shame when he notices one side of the dog's face is slightly swollen. Tony is trembling in fear, just like he is. Whenever Ebby is in a period of transition, homeless or broke, he shows up at his father's house. The last time was a little over a year ago, not long before he met the woman who just kicked him out. He maintained weekly phone contact with his father because he never knew when he might need his house, a fake loan, or real car repairs. At 65 years old, Errol Carson has lived a busy and outwardly fruitful life. He drove school buses for 30 years. When he retired, he opened his small engine repair shop. As Ebby nears the home, more and more lawnmowers dot each side of the driveway. He sees outboard motors leaning on zero-turn lawnmowers save for parts. He sees the skeletons of push mowers rusted with handles missing. He sees a small shed belching gas-powered weed eaters out of the door that's held partially closed with once black foot-long bungee cords with hooks. It looks like junk to him, but his dad says, to him, it looks like money. He must be right, because his father always has money. That's why he keeps coming back again and again, even though his father treats him just like he treats Silver Tony, a correlation he is, at present, remarkably unaware. The property is not too far from town and exactly six acres in area. Three and a half acres are fenced with six foot tall silver chain link fencing. Inside the fencing is the beige brick ranch style home. His parents purchased this home when Ebby was one year old. The first thing his father had done was fence it in so his only child would have a safe place to play, so that his only child would be safe from any creature wishing to invade or harm. How many times had his mother told him that story, which, to Ebby's mind, turned out to be the only act his father voluntarily executed regarding his safety, which made it a pretty pitiful story at the end of the day. Ebby looks at the fence now, rusting a little, but not much. It's hard to see because all the George Tabor azaleas are blooming like crazy on three sides. 
The property is surrounded by sky-reaching pine trees, the perfect environment for growing japonica camellias and azaleas. Because they get the light-filtered shade, plus the acidic nutritional bounty the decaying pine straw produces. Ebby sees big yellow butterflies feeding and fluttering around the juicy pink blooms. He admits it's a stunning sight, the light pink to darker pink five petals star-shaped blooms against the dark evergreen leaves, the giant live oak branches in the background, towering and spreading out, silent and powerful centuries. It's been a long time since the home was visible to visitors. Inside the fenced area, one learned how to find the open spots in the azaleas to see who was coming and going. Inside the fence, the home sits peacefully and securely. There's a long covered porch on the back at whose edge is a 10 by 20 koi pond. His mother fed, nurtured, and with an artist's eyes, carefully chose each uniquely patterned, brightly colored fish. She'd begun teaching him when she unexpectedly died from a brain aneurysm. Ebby was five at the time. He then looked to his poorly equipped father for everything. How Adelia Grand made her way to Errol Carson is still a mystery to both men. Errol is from Collinston, Louisiana, while Adelia was born and reared in Las Vegas, Nevada. She found her way to Monroe through her art. She was awarded a full-ride four-year scholarship in housing to the University of Louisiana at Monroe. Her parents helped her pack secretly excited that the university also boasted a premier pharmacy school. They were hopeful she'd wake up to reality, reality being that art's okay, but it didn't pay the bills. Paintings look good on walls, but how many real people bought them? They didn't. It wasn't that her parents couldn't afford them, but practicality having soundly defeated any visionary attributes they might have once possessed, they viewed buying original art as something only the very wealthy did. The mantra of practicality, repeated and lived, had effectively robbed them of independence as well. Her parents worked eight to five, five days a week, their schedules predictable, boring, flavorless, and productively steady. They'd never get rich, but there was always food on the table and two cars in the garage and clothes on their backs. Adelia's talent was not encouraged or praised, but neither was it discouraged or disdained. She was their only child, a sweet, caring girl whom they adored and allowed to pursue whatever she wished. At appropriate times, practical life-numbing advice was given, sometimes adhered to, sometimes ignored. Edelia was smart and extraordinarily gifted. Her paintings began to attract notice and gather written praise and soon offers of full scholarships to excellent schools. Her parents gently fought the trajectory by congratulating her on the offers while informing her they could not afford housing. She'd have to get a job if she accepted an offer. Quietly, they made her aware of their offer to pay for nursing med pharmacy school while she lived in the apartment over the garage, rent-free. Her father sweetened the tasteless cardboard pie with a new car, all insurance and gas fees paid. Then came the letter and call from ULM. And there went their daughter, seven states away to an unheard-of small southern city. But at least they had an outstanding pharmacy school. What would they have done differently if they'd known she would never come back? The generously proportioned custom home had been the primary residence of an old money family who owned almost every piece of land in the state where a pine tree was planted and thriving. There are two sprawling live oaks in the backyard and one near the left front corner of the home. In front of the home, and a little off to the left, are two and a half acres devoted to his father's love of the Camellia japonica, not the Camellia sasanqua. He began growing them as soon as they moved in, an homage to his wife's admiration of them. Soon, he fell in love with them himself. Errol was pursuing a degree in general studies when one of his professors required them to attend the student art show for extra credit. It was his last semester, and he was ready for a lark because that's what art was to him, something frivolous, not to be taken seriously. Then he saw the painting of the blooming, irrational exuberance camellia, and it stopped him in his tracks. The blooms were as big as his head, seven in all, and all seven different. They were in a circle of six with the seventh in the middle, pink and white and fuchsia on a background of darkest forest green. He'd never seen such beauty, 
until a young woman almost as tall as he interrupted his amazement to introduce herself as the creator of the extraordinary tableau before him. Ebby pulls right up to the back of his father's large painted metal rib garage. He parks his car next to his father's new used Ford 150 truck and thinks, with anger, that's his full-time passenger. He can afford it, what with his retirement, his frugality, stinginess, and the steady stream of small engines coming in and out or dying here. Money is never a problem for his old man. He gets out of his car and almost forgets Tony. Then he remembers, gets back into the car, starts it up, rolls down each window three inches, turns the car off, gets back out, and goes looking for his benefactor, forgetting that his father will have to be the benefactor to the dog as well. The shop sits just inside the chain-link fence on the right. Errol is inside working on a push lawnmower his neighbor Elsie loves like a child. She claimed it was her therapy, her prayer time maker, and she almost cried the day she couldn't start it. He determined it was a $5 fix for which he had no intention of charging her. He liked the sight of her mowing her yard almost as much as she loved doing it. He's just screwed in the last screw when he hears the crunch of gravel on his driveway. He heard a door shut, a door open, the motor reignite, then extinguished anew. With his ear for all things motorized, he knows exactly who it is. He pauses in his work, looks up at the live oaks, and tries to be happy his son is here. But he can't quite manage it. He wipes his hands on a clean rag and waits. It was all he could do. Wait for Ebby. Wait for Ebby to come over. Wait for Ebby to ask for money. Wait for Ebby to ask if he could crash for a while. Wait for Ebby to ask for more money. Wait for Ebby to, to, to do what? To get a job? To grow up? To become a man? To make a contribution? To, to do something? Not just sit around or lie around and wait for something to happen to him. That's what gets him every time. The doing of nothing. Hey, Dad. Hello, son. Come in, come in. How are you? You hungry? Edelia would have been so proud of him. Three days later, Errol is standing at the back of his shop looking into the backyard at the silver pit bull chained beneath the live oak. At the end of the huge chain that was attached to the dog's wide collar was a three-foot solid steel stake jammed hard into the ground. Once Errol said okay, because he always said okay at first, Ebby returned to his car for what Errol assumed would be a suitcase and other belongings. What he did not expect to see was a gangly-looking silver-colored dog being roughly pulled by his son, who seemed oblivious of the dog's uncertainty and fear and reluctance to go with him. Errol said not one word because he was in a state of shock, shock because there had not been a pet in this home since his wife passed away, and never had there been a dog. His wife loved cats. He tolerated her cats because he wanted to please his wife. He'd never been around animals in his life, and the two cats his wife left behind soon disappeared. Errol's grief was so intense and long-lived, he never noticed the absence of the two solid black cats who left because they could. He only noticed their absence when it dawned on him that he hadn't bought cat food in over six months. Their bowls were full and stinky with mold. He'd panicked like an insane person. He became deranged, bug-eyed. He searched for them for weeks, but he never found them, and they never came back. Georgia and Alfred. He'd cried like a baby. So unreasonably hard it had frightened the five-year-old Debbie, a sensitive child who'd hidden in his rooms and among the thick, strong limbs of the oaks until his father returned to his body. His father did return, but he was not the same daddy who was there while his mother was alive. Errol felt as though he had betrayed the memory of his wife by losing her cats. But it was not his neglect of the cats that would have saddened his beautiful Adelia. It was the neglect and subsequent close-minded treatment of their child, Ebner, that would have truly anguished her. Meanwhile, Georgia and Alfred were oblivious to the uproar they'd caused and, quite frankly, could have cared less. They were two miles away, living it up as barn cats, fat, healthy, and as comfortable as could be. Adelia's cats, accustomed to her care and attention, craved company and the companionship of humans. They'd left to find it and didn't stop until they did. The elegant, massive barn was a hub of activity, filled with the near-constant swish of moving hay, laughing humans, gentle horses, and not nearly enough mice or lizards. There is no doghouse, and after the argument this morning, there is no ebby. 
Three days ago, he'd watched his son chain his dog underneath the live oak. Two days ago, he'd watched Ebby walk out to feed the dog. He'd seen the dog's obvious happiness at the sight of his son. He'd watched the dog jump around in his excitement and accidentally knock the filled food dish from Ebby's hands. He watched Ebby avoid touching the dog and then cuss him out. He watched Ebby throw the empty bowl back toward the house and then walk away, not attempting to gather the food from the ground, most of which the dog couldn't even reach. When he went inside for his lunch, his son was melted into the sofa with his phone lovingly cradled in his hands. He does not know why Ebby has a dog, especially since it's so obvious he can't stand him and is most likely afraid of him. The dog is big, and Errol knows the dog will only get bigger. His paws are huge, and his blocky head is too big for his body. But he knows he'll catch up in no time. He already looks pretty scary. He has dark gray-green eyes that complement the unusual silver color of his coat. He already has a big muscular chest with a solid white, Brazil-shaped patch on it. Errol had taken to studying him while he worked on engines. He determines that the dog is beautiful and bored. He watches him roll around on grass that will soon be dirt. He watches him watching squirrels. And he laughs out loud when the dog tries, without success, to catch a large yellow and black butterfly. When he looked over at him, Errol could have sworn he was grinning too. The argument is over the dog whose name he learns is fittingly Silver Tony. Errol is not all that upset that the dog is at his house. But his son's treatment of the dog is not only inhumane, but appallingly degrading to life. What idiot chains a dog? You weren't brought up like that. You know better than to treat a living being like that. How would you like to be chained up, only able to move six feet in any direction, no shelter? And the one who sought you out and brought you home hates your guts. I don't hate that dog. It sure looks like you do. It's just a dog. Son, nothing is just something. Well... He's not yours, so don't worry about it. You think it's okay to force another living being to live like that? Or is he a robot? Can't think or feel. Is he a robot? It's just some dog, Daddy. Errol is dumbfounded by his son's words and attitude. He can't believe what he's hearing or seeing. Not from Adelia's child. What happened to you, son? I never thought the son of Adelia Carson would have such disdain for life. You dishonor her memory. For as long as Errol Carson lives, he will never forget the expression of heartbreaking despair that washed over his son's face. The devastation his words caused his only child were blatantly obvious. How could he ever take those terrible words back? Why did he say that? Ebby, I, I, I'm your son too. You think on that, Daddy. The next morning, Ebby is gone. He does not return that morning or that afternoon. From his cushioned chair at the back of his shop, where he usually worked due to the pleasant view and the breeze, he sits with a repaired carburetor in his hands. He sits still. He's not looking at the carburetor. Errol is looking at the pit bull puppy who has not eaten. He's telling himself he's not his dog when he hears, clear as a bell, the voice of his deceased wife softly say, It's not Tony's fault, baby. The gentle, quiet utterance makes him jump up from his seat and go inside the house at a full run. He runs inside, not because he wants to make sure the dog is fed, but because he does not want to hear that beloved voice tell him it's his fault. For six hours, he's been working on a carburetor that would normally take him less than 20 minutes to diagnose and repair. His mind has been on his life and the life he gave his son. He has been questioning not only his choices, but his method of upbringing. It's one thing for him to question. It's a whole other ball of wax to be questioned by another. To be questioned by his deceased wife is more than he can handle. Feeding the dog pushes away all reckoning for the moment. When he walks back outside, fully back to himself, he shakes his head in disgust at the sight of the dog under the tree with no proper shelter. Why did Ebby chain him in the first place? The yard is fully fenced and, to his mind, escape-proof. He doesn't know much about dogs, but he does know about life. He knows that imprisoning any living entity has serious long-term repercussions. It only harms. It does not build. And it does not bless. As he nears the dog with the bowl of kibble, 
the last remaining in the small bag Ebby brought. He looks at the dog and is suddenly struck by his beauty. It's as though in a flash he can see how the dog will look when he's fully grown, intimations of which, even now, are clearly visible. He'll be broad-shouldered, and his body will be perfectly proportioned to a head that looks way too big right now. If he's exercised regularly, he'll have wonderful musculature. And Errol can see that this breed is born for extreme athletic work. This dog was born to run and jump and climb and explore. Silver Tony is sitting on his haunches, watching the human who, he hopes, will feed and care for him. His tail is wagging back and forth on the grass. As he nears him, Errol can see that he is well named because his coat does, in fact, look like silver. It shines and glistens when the filtered sunlight hits it just right. When he's eight feet away from Tony, the dog cowers down in total submission and fear. Errol pauses and feels ashamed for no reason. He puts the bowl down where Tony can reach it and walks back to his shop. He can hear that Tony has not moved. When he's once again seated in the old sturdy chair, he looks over at the dog and is relieved to see him with his face buried in the kibble. Errol sighs in resignation. He had not planned on making a trip to town today, but now he has no choice if the dog is to have food. Ebby doesn't show up, doesn't show up, and still doesn't show up. One morning, Errol looks at his cell phone, which he rarely uses but keeps charged. He notices he has a three-day-old text from his son. It reads, Got a job offshore. Back in six months. We'll send money for the dog. Tony, Errol says out loud. His name is Tony. Thunder rumbles and cracks open the sky when he returns the cell phone to its perch over the refrigerator. Rain is falling hard by the time he makes it across the yard to his shop. He's closing the doors against the lashing rain when he remembers Tony. He looks over to find the dog drenched and standing at the end of his chain watching him. Errol almost cusses out loud. He runs across the yard and reaches forward to unlatch the chain from the collar, but his intent is blocked because the chain is padlocked to the collar. The only way he can get it off is by sawing the collar away. Using bolt cutters in this downpour would surely invite an accident. He stands up and moves toward the stake in the ground. It's pouring so hard he can barely see and he almost slips down on his way to it because Tony has already almost walked away all the grass. He puts two hands around the iron stake and begins to pull and pull, but it won't budge. He turns back to Tony and sees the dog standing patiently yet indifferently watching him. Errol wonders how many times the animal has experienced this misery, expecting nothing from the humans who deliberately chose him. His clothes are soaking wet, but with a new determination and maybe even a new spring in his step, he jogs to the shop and gets the saw he knows will quickly cut through Tony's collar. Back at Tony's area, which is now three inches deep with rain, Errol reaches for the dog. Tony flinches and goes down in the water to his belly. Errol almost curses his son, but a cold finger running down the length of his spine immediately stops his hard words. With as much gentleness as possible in the torrential downpour, he saws off the collar and leaves it where it falls. Instinctively sensing freedom and a gentle quality in this human, Tony bounds away and runs as fast as he can for Errol's shop. Errol picks up the two metal dog bowls, tumps out the water, and jogs toward his home. Inside the clean, dry mudroom, he removes his wet, muddy clothes, dries himself off, and quickly puts on dry jeans, socks, and t-shirt. He slips his sock-covered feet into his mud boots and grabs four big towels on his way out, one of which he holds over his head and shoulders as he makes his way to Tony. Just inside the shop doors on the dry but inhospitable concrete floor, Tony is curled tightly into a sopping, wet, shivering ball. The sight stops Errol in his tracks. At that precise moment, something begins to finally unfurl inside of him. A strong gust of wind almost lifts him up, it pushes him into the shop, nearer to the miserable puppy. His anger and righteous judgment completely forgotten, he walks slowly toward the suffering dog. He crouches down and begins to dry him off. Tony, who has only been clumsily held and petted as a little bitty puppy, has no idea what's happening. His experience leads him to believe the worst. 
He's too afraid to move because he thinks this human will put him back out in the storm that felt like BBs hitting his face and body. He looks up at the human's face and senses no threat of violence. Slowly, eventually, he relaxes his body entirely. What the human is doing feels good. Errol rubs and rubs and massages and massages. And by the time he's finished, he's petting the head of a sleeping dog. He sits down beside him on the concrete and watches the rain continue to fall in sheets. His mind quiet. He begins to think about things that never occurred to him until now. Before he gets up to go inside, he notices the deep impression on Tony's neck. He knows it's from the collar because he just sawed it off. He had no idea it was so tight. If he'd known, he would have done something. Why didn't he know? He was right there in the backyard. What on earth is wrong with him? How did he get to this place? He admits to himself that he cannot hold his son guilty of everything. Now, the back doors to Errol's shop are wide open, and the sun is shining high in the sky. Errol takes a break from cleaning the gunk off of an engine that deserves to be saved to watch Tony run around the large fenced yard barking at squirrels who just escape his chase. A blue jay is actively dive-bombing him for territorial intrusion issues. Silver Tony dodges and jumps and barks at the big blue and white bird. It makes Errol smile to see the dog play like a puppy. The smile stays when he considers that he has in some small way contributed to his carefree joy. To watch Tony run all over the big yard and know he's safe, to observe him grow and mature, has been a gift. Spending time with the dog who is growing larger and larger every day has somehow calmed his mind and spirit. The way Tony looks at him with trust and the ever-present offer of loyal friendship soothes him. It won't be long before he'll admit to himself that spending time with Tony and taking care of him is healing his grieving soul. He leans back in his creaking chair and dozes off. The warmth of the sun, the sounds of the birds, the running feet of Silver Tony safe and sound lull him into dreamless slumber. When he awakens, his hand is on top of Tony's big head, and Tony's big head is on his left thigh. In a sleepy daze, he pets the dog slowly and contentedly. He runs his hand on the soft fur of his head. He massages him behind his ears. He scratches the back of his neck that has long lost the blighted indentation from a lack of perspective and too much ignorance. He doesn't blame his absent son. He blames himself. Tony presses his body against Errol's legs, and Errol sits up to give his companion a good rib rub. As his fingers run up and down Tony's sides, he suddenly notices that his hands don't ache like they usually do at this time of day. He finds himself staying more and more in his shop, but won't yet concede the reason. On a day that winter begins to make itself known, he takes Tony to town. Tony has been going with him more and more often. People ooh and ah, and Tony grins and wiggles and gets as many pets and offers of treats as he can. He is the friendliest dog Errol has ever seen. He loves everyone. He puts a smile on people's faces wherever he goes, and that includes the face of Errol Carson, most of all. The truck seems to move of its own volition to a nearby pet store. He asks Tony to wait while he goes inside to investigate. He's been thinking about doing something drastic, but for some reason... He's hesitating. The pet store puts an end to that hesitation once and for all. Errol feels nothing but relief from his decision and subsequent actions. He can't help but ask himself why he waited so long. When they arrive home, the first task to be conquered is the fertilization of the camellias. With Tony trotting along beside him, Errol drives the four-wheeler up to the back of the truck and unloads bag after bag onto the metal rack of the ATV. Tony runs along beside him as he drives toward the flowering evergreens. It has taken him two decades to grow this feast for the eyes. In memory of his wife, he began with the planting of three irrational exuberant shrubs. Each of the three plants reached maturity more than a decade ago. They now mark the entrance to the acreage which he has transformed into a double-rolled spiral that has yet to end. He has, as much as he can on the ground, tried diligently to be exacting in the spacing of his plantings. He hopes that what God sees from his vantage point is a perfect spiral that winds round and round seven times, always tightening 
until the very end, which is an oval space 30 feet in circumference and awaiting the last three plants. Errol has placed the shrubs a good distance apart because his hope is that one day, when he's long gone, his camellias will remain and those that can be huge will be huge and those that were not meant to be huge will be their own beauty while complementing and emphasizing the beauty of the larger plants. The boldly blooming evergreens have become a source of solace and sanity. The skillfully executed canvases that graced the walls of his home introduced him to a vast new world, a world which he has scoured over the years for the most unusual plantings. The U.S., Australia, Portugal, Japan, Germany, and on and on. Errol is always searching for new colors and varieties. The blooms fascinate him. Each year, his favorite type changes. Last year, he couldn't get enough of the camellias with the single flowers. The year before that, it was the semi-doubles. Before that, the irregular semi-double. For at least three years, he has adored the formal doubles. When the blooming season hits, his countertops are dotted with white ceramic bowls displaying floating rich-colored blooms that seem to maintain their color and shape forever. The elegance orm, the informal double, all the different flower forms offer so much beauty, will feed a mood, change a mood, lighten a burdened spirit. When he's within the ever-growing spiral, he feels at peace and closer to the memory of Adelia. The planning of his giant spiral is based on the number three. Three camellias begin the spiral and plant groupings of three continue throughout it. Planted with geometric precision, there are two larger camellias with a smaller one in front, making the plantings a consecutive series of triangles. The camellias at the beginning are full grown, while the camellias within the layers of the spiral are younger and younger. Each year, Errol adds three groups of three, and each group of three represents himself, Adelia, and Ebby. As he drives toward the masterpiece he is unknowingly creating, he wonders how he could always think of his son, yet fail to consider him. He stops the four-wheeler and turns it off when he reaches the first three camellias he planted. It's the same cultivar in the painting that introduced him to his wife and an ensuing world of unknown wonders. Kind of like you, Tony. That's what you are. An unknown wonder. Every day that I'm with you, I remember more and more of my happier days. You've brought peace back into my life. Hopefully, Ebby will return and I can do the same for him, because I sure gave him very little peace or comfort after his mother died. I have much to answer for regarding the rearing of my beloved Adelia Carson's son. Had it not been for him bringing the gift of you into my life, I think I would have died a lost soul and never even known it. Thank you for being exactly who and what you are, Tony. If I'd known a dog could remind me how to be a human being, I would have never been without one. You are remarkable, my fine sir. A sweet fragrance wafts over him. He breathes in deeply, grateful for the unpredictable weather patterns of his region, which have caused the irregular blooming of his gardenias. The flowers may be turning from bright white to yellow, but their fragrance is as potent as if they bloom today. He breathes in deeply once more. As he exhales, he looks over at Tony. Tony is watching him attentively with those unusual gray-green eyes, and he's convinced, has understood every word he said. He hopes he did. Month after month passes without a word from his son. Tony spends every waking moment with Errol. They're always together. Tony is near him when he works. He rides with him when he leaves. He eats with him, enjoying choice tidbits Errol offers from gently moving fingertips. He naps with Errol in the recliner, their long, muscular bodies filling up every crevice in the generous, cushioned space. Both of them are inevitably asleep 30 minutes into any television program. And to Errol's great surprise, Tony sleeps with him in the bed every night. This dog... A dog! This dog has brought more insight into living and rational thinking into his life than he has ever experienced. Tony is changing him. Tony is changing him into a better man. As Errol moves from Adolf Audison to almost Anita to Edna Campbell, 
He's as aware of Tony as he is of the evergreen beauty of these camellias he has painstakingly planted and nurtured over the years. He begins at the beginning of the spiral. It will take him about four hours to fertilize every plant if he doesn't get sidetracked, which he already is because he can't stop watching Tony. As he watches Tony investigate his surroundings, his wagging tail reminds him of their visit to the vet's office. The longer he didn't hear from his son, the more he grew attached to Tony. His son had not neutered him, and he doubted he'd had any vaccines or was on heartworm treatment. He'd met some of the people his son called friends. He knew they weren't even capable of true friendship. They only cared about what they were getting or doing for themselves or what could be done for them. Taking care of a dog was more than likely very low on their list of things to do, if it was on any list at all. His son brought him home and chained him up, so he assumed that Tony was always chained up in someone's backyard. What he witnessed from his son's treatment of the dog indicated he had no idea how to care for a companion animal. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, no one had taught him. When Tony had been with Errol for a little over a month and had thoroughly worked his way into his slowly softening heart, Errol decided that whether or not his son came back, Tony was home for good. He also decided that Tony is his dog now and forever. Though he never had pets growing up and didn't know anyone who did, his wife taught him the importance of medical checkups and consultations. He saw the way she cared for her cats. She told him again and again that if they ever got a dog, they had to make sure he or she was always on heartworm prevention. She'd seen photos of the disease, its out-of-control rampancy in the South, and it terrified her. So as soon as he'd made the decision to keep Tony safe and unchained for the rest of his life, he took him to the vet. At the vet's office, Tony is a perfect gentleman. Errol tells him he had no hand in his manners, that Tony is a dog born with innate dignity. The veterinarian told him that most all dogs are, but humans mercilessly strip them of it by their cavalier treatment of them. She said it wasn't even being irresponsible the way people didn't properly or even compassionately care for their dogs in the South. Most people in the South don't view animals as sentient beings. She told him it was pure ignorance and that while she could forgive and educate, malice was something altogether different. Most people don't realize that malice is first cousin to indifference. He watched as Tony sat patiently and let the vet techs pet him and praise him. He could see how much he enjoyed it. He'd put his ears back and move his head toward the gentle hands, his tail always wagging. He was patient while they poked him with needles and other implements necessary to confirm his good health, and if not, to find solutions to get him there. All lab tests came back perfect and heartworm negative. Errol had released the breath he'd been holding. His wife would have squeezed his hand in relief, then squeezed his forearm and looked at him, silently asking him why he waited so long to help the dog. As Errol works on opening the bags of fertilizer and dumping them into the five-gallon plastic bucket, he watches Tony out of the corner of his eye. Then, because he can't help himself, he stops and devotes all his attention to this dog he will now admit he loves. The name is Just. His gray coat glistens in the sunlight and truly looks like molten silver. His chest has become broader. The muscles on his hind legs give testimony to the strength within. He's wearing a dark purple collar around his thick neck, and from it hangs a big silver heart with Tony's name on it and Errol's phone number. A microchip inhabits him and informs finders of detailed contact information. He hesitated over buying the heart him being a big old boy and all, and Errol, insecure about showing his hand, letting the world know he cherished a dog. There were bone-shaped ID tags, circles, rectangles, and octagons. He'd taken his time looking at all of them. Tony stood by his side, watching the people and children come and go, but most of all, enjoying the feeling, the new feeling he sensed inside the heart of the tall, broad-shouldered man standing next to him. It was a feeling of forever. How could Tony discern this when he'd never encountered it? How does he know this man loves him, that this human is his forever? Because he is a dog. A dog cannot speak, cannot produce words, or even understand the vast majority of what humans say. 
but a dog has extraordinary senses. They can even sense intent. Here with this man, Silver Tony has always sensed a rock-steady calmness, something the other man never had. He was always confused and anxious, but never truly mean-spirited. He just didn't know how to do life. But this man, who takes him with him everywhere, who feeds him and pets him and talks to him and lets him stretch his long legs in athletic pursuits, this man is a forever man. It's just the way he was made. Errol feels Tony press against his leg, and he removes the silver heart-shaped name tag instead of the bone-shaped tag right next to it. As Errol leans against the side of the four-wheeler, he takes delight in the puppy named Silver Tony, because he's still a puppy. The vet estimated his age to be about nine months old, and she smiled when she informed him how big he'd probably be. Errol had returned her smile, pleased by every single piece of information the vet imparted. He watches Tony chase a squirrel and is relieved yet surprised that he was unsuccessful. It surprised him because Tony can move. Those long legs stretching out, his strong toes curling his toenails into the earth to gain greater traction, that vigor and enthusiasm of youth and health. This dog can run. He almost got that fat brown squirrel. Almost. He laughs when the squirrel reaches a high, thick branch in the oak and turns to chatter wildly at the large silver dog bouncing around excitedly beneath him. Taunts? Epithets? Probably a little of both. As he pours organic fertilizer around the base of each sturdy green-leafed camellia, he reflects on how Tony has been a revelation, how he has brought him back to the land of the living, how he has reminded him what being alive and living actually means. It does not mean holding yourself away from others. He cringes at the thought. This is what he did to his son soon after Adelia passed. He held himself away. A bad habit that grew with expertise and completeness more and more as the years passed. He'd become a lone man living alone who didn't even recognize how much he missed and craved the company of others until his son left this extraordinary and accidental gift for him. It has been delightful meeting so many new people because of Tony. Everywhere they go, he makes new friends. Errol thinks he has talked to more people in the last month than he has in the last 20 years. And he's ashamed of himself. He cut himself off from others. Most of all, from his then five-year-old son, who was grieving just as much as he. What does a child do who has lost direction, compassion, and love? He must admit that though he's always claimed to love his son, his actions say something altogether different. Each year after the death of his wife, he grew farther and farther away from his only child. He housed, clothed, and fed him. That was it. He just paid the bills. As he spreads fertilizer around the base of the ten-foot-tall Smoky Dawns, he must pause as he remembers a particularly uncaring scene when Ebby was twelve years old. Ebby possesses the mind and gifts of his mother. His wife once told him that his talents, abilities, and intellect far surpassed hers. But he didn't believe her. As a man completely besotted with his wife, he could not fathom anyone being more gifted than she, but he knew she was right. He knew because he saw it, until he didn't see it anymore. Ebby, the child, was filled to the brim with laughter, ideas, and wonder. He was curious about everything. He wanted to know how a flower grew and why it was pink instead of brown. He wanted to know how long a school bus was and how many Nubian goats could fit inside. He wanted to know why sometimes the breeze blew cool, yet mostly warm. He was never a mundane child. Edelia nurtured his curiosity and praised his artistic skill, all the while teaching him how to embrace the life of an artist, how fully embracing life itself was part of the life of an artist. As scenes of his callous indifference buzz across and fill his mind, Errol shudders and falls to his knees beside the Katsuro Nomura camellias. Why was it okay for his wife to be an artist, but not his son? That boy of his was gifted. He can still remember every single thing Ebby created or the drawings he'd shown him with a plan to design. Even at seven years old, his talent was remarkable 
Any emotionally stingy, closed-off curmudgeon could clearly see it. No one can deny real beauty. It just, it just can't be done. It's so obvious to even the simplest understanding. The tragedy is, it can also be ignored. Errol is standing in Adelia's studio. It's actually three bedrooms turned into one large room. That's why they would bought this huge house with six bedrooms and three and a half bathrooms. The house had the perfect configuration for their family. On one end was the master suite, which was directly across the hall from two bedrooms which shared a Jack and Jill bathroom. The first thing they'd done before they even unpacked was knock down walls. He can remember it as though it happened five minutes ago. Her excitement, her plans. This was the first room they'd completely unpacked. They'd all slept on an air mattress in front of the big fireplace in the living room until the work was completed on her studio. He can still hear her voice whispering so as not to wake Ebby, who slept between them, in his ear before he fell asleep that first night. You see how wonderful it all is, Errol? Those windows along the front of the rooms look like they were meant for one room. I knew that when we saw it. The natural light is so perfect. I can paint. And there's room for sculpture if we raise the ceiling two more feet. And you said yourself we could. Oh, bless the architect and this family for being ahead of their time. Can you imagine a ranch home built in 1964 with ten-foot ceilings? God bless them so much. And across from our bedroom will be the bedrooms of our two children. It's just so perfect. I love this house. I love my life. I love our child. And I love you, baby. He remembers hugging Ebby to him and rolling away from her so she couldn't see his tears. He remembers her rolling right along with him her arms wrapped all the way around them, her head tucked right against his, his arms holding her arms, him wondering how he got so lucky, Ebby, sleeping like the baby he was. Her enthusiasm and wise planning soon filled their home with joy and order. She had a plan for everything. She'd even planned Ebby. And had she not been taken too soon, her plans for their second child would have met with the same undeniable success all her plans achieved. He has a child's shoebox in his hands. The lid is taped shut. Was that the day he closed his heart to his son? The child's disappointment and hurt blasts him now, and though his hands are shaking, he's determined to uncover what he never, ever, ever should have covered in the first place. He hasn't looked inside the box in 13 years. From time to time, he has to look down at Tony so that his courage remains. Tony, sitting on his haunches in front of his human nose, the box contains pain. His unerring skill set senses it. He will remain still and true so he can help in any way. The tape crackles and splits easily. Errol must take this slowly. He removes every piece of tape and is about to throw it away when... To procrastinate and mark the finality of his actions and the change occurring in his life, he takes the tape outside and burns it. Back inside the studio, Tony joins him on the sofa covered with a tattered patchwork quilt. Adelia was always on the hunt for old bedding so that when paint or glue or tears occurred on one coverlet, another was ready to replace it. Underneath the quilt is a dark brown velvet sofa which sat in someone's formal living room for years. Maybe welcoming ten to twenty rear ends in a span of thirty years. Such was the way Southerners used to live. It still looks brand new to this day. But the sofa is not the focus of the moment. What's inside the closed box sitting on Errol's lap is. Tony sits beside him, leaning against him for support and encouragement. When his human takes a long, deep breath, Tony licks him on his forehead to let him know everything will be all right. When Errol removes the lid, he can only stare down at the contents. Thank God he hadn't thrown them away. What is he thinking? He would have never thrown them away. Because though he systematically crushed every artistic dream or vision his son had from age 5 to age 12 until his unplanned goal was achieved, he never got rid of anything his son created. And he never asked why he stopped creating or envisioning. He just faded away. There but completely absent. The silence he thought was comforting was actually the sound of death. Now, 
having experienced months of affection, interest, selflessness, joy, and the thrill of being alive in every moment from Silver Tony, he can reach into the box and remove one of the three most exquisite works of art he has ever seen. They were not created by his wife's mind or hands. The first is a wooden carving of one of the live oaks in the front yard. To be exact, it's the live oak sprawling in front of Adelia's studio. He holds it carefully in his hands, and Tony knows instinctively how precious it is and that he should not lick it or eat it. Errol stands and walks to the window to compare the two. They are remarkable in their sameness. Yet somehow it seems that the little three-by-three-inch carving in his hand is more alive than the giant reaching for the sky in front of him. The trunk of the carving seems to move with life. The tiny little leaves are carved to perfection, and Errol is astounded that an eleven-year-old child could execute such intense mastery. He gently places the carving on one of the small shelves jutting out from the window frame. There are two more works of art in the small box. The second one is of Georgia and Alfred. They're sitting side by side with their tails curling around each other as they look straight into the eyes of their beholder. When he brings the figurine closer, he can see that Ebby has somehow manipulated the metal to bring forth whiskers and eyelashes on each of the cats. The figure is elegant and forceful, just like the subjects. Ebby had somehow taught himself to work in metals. Amazing. His son is amazing. The metal cats look as though they're about to step forward at any second. As he places it on the shelf above the live oak carving, he wonders how a person could see such beauty created by a self-taught child and then constantly tell that child of the useless frivolity of such creation. He doesn't deserve that boy. He knows what the third work is but he must go to the shop and work on a complex zero-turn lawnmower repair before he can unpack it. It will hurt him the most. Tony stays close without having to be asked. He can sense that his human has a lot on his mind and that important decisions are being formulated. He's here to offer all the support he can. It's what his human does for him. Ebby is seated on a park bench watching fat flakes of snow float slowly to the ground while bright red cardinals meet and eat. The sight is so breathtakingly beautiful. He tries to stop what happens, but for the life of him he cannot, and it makes him miserable. Yet no matter what he does, he cannot stop the thing that happens every time he sees something beautiful. His mind takes flight, and ideas tumble in like a wave only an expert surfer can ride. For thirteen years... Ebby has struggled with the powerful imagination. He did drugs. He drank. He whored. He gambled. He stole. He lied. He did every depraved act that would come to the mind of a pure being in order to stop the ideas from tumbling in. Nothing worked. So three months ago, he stopped trying to stop them. He found work that bored him to death and didn't come close to paying a living wage. He moved on and on and then moved some more until he came here, to a bench in a park in a huge city, somewhere far from everything and everyone he has ever known. His job as a bar helper begins in an hour. He can see the bar from where he sits. It's cool and charming in an upscale neighborhood. And finally, maybe something wonderful can happen. He doesn't know how, but there remains that slight, tiny little hope that his mama made him swear he would never, ever, ever relinquish. He remembers his mother, and for her sake, he jumps onto the top of the wave of ideas, and for the next 50 minutes, while watching the pristine elegance of snowfall, he dreams and creates and paints and sculpts and bends all metals to his designing will. Pigeons landing noisily near his feet wake him from his artistic reverie. He is not refreshed. How can one be refreshed by meditating on miraculous things that will never come to pass? For the life of him, he can't figure it out. He bends over to retie the black laces on his second or third hand black sneakers. When he sits up, he takes a breath. Not too deep, because he doesn't want to breathe out any of the wonder he has just absorbed into himself. 
He makes up his mind then and there. If he's to be bar help, he'll be the best bar help he can be. He has come to a place where no one knows him. He can be anyone, just not the one he was designed to be. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay, he thinks. Time to move on. Time to figure it out. However that's supposed to be done, he reckons it'll get done. He has no idea how to proceed other than what he's doing now. Time to grow up. Money doesn't grow on trees, a familiar voice echoes in his mind. Tomorrow he has an appointment with a psychiatrist. He's read there are medications that can help the brain become more disciplined. Why does it make him want to weep when he thinks that his father might finally be proud of him? Silver Tony is full grown now. His body has grown to match his huge head. His shoulders are broad, his muscular chest broader. He weighs almost 85 pounds, and Errol knows that most of that weight is pure muscle. Tony loves to run and climb and jump like nothing he's ever seen. The fenced backyard is strewn with toys, stands, circles, and more. What Errol can't buy or balks at paying, he and his friends will build. Yes, friends. The too quiet, tucked into himself widow of Adelia Carson has friends. He has good friends. His frequent trips to the parts store in the feed and seed co op with Tony always by his side have been life changing because of Silver Tony, his beauty, his loving nature, and his gentleness. Errol has had more conversations in the past year and a half than he's had since his wife passed. He met Lambert Bryant, who was a quarter horse breeder. A conversation struck up between them in the checkout line when the cash register stalled and patience was required in the face of slow motion incompetency. Lambert had been watching Tony, not getting too close because the dog was so big, but he couldn't take his eyes off of him because he seemed so sweet. Lambert commented on his excellent manners, and one thing led to another until they found out they had a great deal in common. The most pressing was an old favorite tractor Lambert had been trying to get to run for the past two years. Errol went out, applied his expertise, and soon the old beast was running like the powerhouse she was. Like Errol, Lambert's wife was deceased and his children lived states away. A friendship began, and like anyone who's open to new friendships, friendships inevitably birth more friendships. Lambert, Garrett Lacey, who owned the co-op, Sandy DeWitt, who could weld anything anywhere, came into Errol's world when Garrett suggested his skills for a tower idea Errol wanted to build for Tony. Sanny brought Rushing Gravel into his life when he saw the remarkable spiral planting of Errol's camellias. Rushing, who never got into a rush about anything, was a renowned regional master gardener who bragged on his japonica camellias until he saw what Errol had done all by himself. When the two men weren't discussing horticulture, they were traveling down to Forest Hills to load the trailer for Gravel's nursery and, of course, to hunt for obscure japonicas. Or all four, plus Eldridge Pierce, who owned the local newspaper and held a lifelong fascination with the pit bull breed, would be sitting at the bingo hall every Wednesday night, playing, talking, discussing dinner options, and endlessly praising Silver Tony for being the best behaved of all five of them. Because of his son bringing this dog into his life, his world and spirit has expanded in ways he never could have imagined. And oh, how grateful he is. This unique creature has reminded him of the unique value of life. And most of all, he has brought his troubled mind to a place of stillness and peace. Errol thinks with clarity now instead of every moment being viewed through a dense fog of grief and mind-blinding sorrow. He and Silver Tony are sitting in the front seat of Errol's truck in a posh suburb of Seattle, Washington. Four months ago, he traded in his truck for a shiny silver one with more towing power. He wants to be prepared for any task, any heavy haul. He's going over his speech with Tony and almost doesn't recognize the skinny man crossing the street in front of them. Ebby doesn't even look like himself. Why is he so skinny? It's not from drugs. The private detective he hired to find him had trailed him for the last two weeks. He told Errol that his son did not drink or do drugs. He got up, went for a walk, ate lunch, went to work. Worked, got off work, went directly home. Repeat, repeat, repeat. But he knows why Ebby is so skinny. I know why Ebby is so skinny, don't I, Tony? That's my fault, and I own it. Now let's see if we can do anything about it. Do you know what his given name is? It's Ebner. You know what it means? 
It means Father of Light. That's the name Adelia and I chose for our son. We chose it with consideration and careful thought. And that's who he was until Errol, his strong and courageous father, put a big black bucket over him. A bucket so black and so heavy that it managed to hide his light. Nobody can see it anymore. Not even him. Tony listens patiently. This has been quite the adventure. They've been driving for three days so they can park right next to a huge, wonderful green piece of land and not step foot on it. Tony sighs, but he trusts his human. Whatever they're doing must be something that needs to be done. What's a black bucket? Errol reaches over to pet Tony, and Tony walks into his lap because he knows his human likes it as much as he does. He's rubbing Tony and waiting until he can't wait any more. He latches the leash onto Tony's collar, and both fit gentlemen descend quickly from the big project beckoning truck. Tony doesn't pull on the leash. There's no point in it. He knows that his human knows the direction they must go. He has not let him down yet. When Tony and Errol step onto the wide, snow-covered sidewalk, they don't notice the looks and smiles directed toward them. But they are a sight. Errol looks handsome and marvelous in a shiny silver down jacket, and Tony is huge and undeniably gorgeous. He's wearing a dark gray sweater that makes his short silver coat pop and shine. He walks proudly beside his human, not pausing to encourage, meet, or greet as he usually does because he can't help himself. He's a fellow who was born to love, and that's what he does every day, all day long, because that's what he was born to do. But today, he senses they're on a very important mission, something serious and filled with destiny. He can sense the unusual nervousness emanating from his human. He remains calm and focused, so it'll help Errol do the same. Errol comes to a stop just before the building which houses the bar where his son works hard six days a week as a barkeep. He's only ten feet from him when he exits, and he can't take his eyes off of him. Too skinny, dark circles under his eyes. No confidence. But it's the most beautiful thing he's ever seen in his life. His heart soars while his eyes feast. This young man, who looks lost and lonely, was almost lost to him. Thank you, Tony, for the wake-up, he thinks. He takes him in from head to foot. His dark brown hair hasn't seen a professional pair of scissors in quite some time. But Errol bets it's clean because his son was always careful about his appearance. He looks at the worn black coat and notices the seam has come apart along the bottom edge. The lining is actively exiting as he watches. His eyes travel down the faded black pants to the well-used shoes where Errol can see the sole on the left one is just about to detach. He feels shame and elation at the same time. He vows to do what he should have been doing for the past 20 years. He vows to nurture, guide, lead, love, listen, help, praise, encourage, feed, and bless. Now that he has regained the capability, he will feed his son's concave belly as well as his spirit. He has a lot to make up for, and he will. It frightens him to death to think he almost lost his only child to his selfishness. Never-ending grief is not only self-indulgent. It's selfish. It's unfair to everyone. It's wrong. Ebby looks stunned. He has just been informed by the maitre d' that he will no longer be needed. The owner's sister was able to exit drug rehab on the condition that she be monitored by family and work a full-time job. The sister is 45 years old and doesn't know how to do anything but drugs. The maitre d' tells Ebby that the owner and all of his family have been waiting a very long time for just such an opportunity to help her. The maitre d' extends the owner's apologies and a smooth hand with cash in it with two weeks' wages. Ebby can do nothing but take the money he desperately needs, but knows will not be enough. The generous tips he received were what paid the bills. He simply nods his thanks, turns around, and heads back into the cold. He hadn't expected to be fired today. How does one do life when one is doing the best one can, and it's horribly not enough? How long does he stand outside in front of the bar wondering what to do next, wondering if this is the rest of his life, working hard only to be fired? 
He knows he did nothing wrong. He knows it because he tried so hard. He wonders if he can get a letter of recommendation. He turns back to go inside to ask when he sees a massive silver-gray pit bull not four feet from him. He sees the wide black woven collar with flat silver studs. He looks into the dark gray-green steady expectant gaze and thinks, this dog is loved. This dog is cared for. This dog is treated with respect and intelligence. He cannot take his eyes away from the sight of the huge, confident dog in the gray sweater. It mesmerizes him. A pit bull in a sweater. What a magnificent creature. Such beauty. So much poise and assurance. An unpleasant, sticky memory is rising when a familiar voice says a name he hasn't heard for a very long time. Ebner? He tears his eyes away from the dog he now knows is Silver Tony, relief washing over him. How many times has he thought about this dog or wanted to ask about the dog he abandoned, the dog he treated like dirt, the dog he treated like an inanimate object when he knew good and well that he was a living, breathing, thinking, feeling, problem-solving being. The people he hung with, the idiot he'd become, And his father, here, all the way in Seattle, Washington. He looks so dashing and vibrant in the puffy silver jacket, gently holding on to the black leash that is attached to Tony's collar. Is he here? A man who hadn't driven farther than 15 miles from his home in how many years? Is he back on the waves of his mind? Is is this real? Can it be real? Is Tony smiling at him? He looks up at what may or may not be a mirage and quietly inquires. Daddy? Son, would you please come take a ride with us? I don't know if you can forgive me, but I'm willing to beg if I need to. Errol is smiling as he listens to the sawing and hammering coming from Ebby's studio. He and Silver Tony are strolling through his Japonica camellia spiral that seems to have exploded in color overnight. The numerous evergreens are blooming with an abandon he's never before witnessed. Big pink blooms, pink and white blooms, pink red blooms, rose red blooms, red blooms, red and white blooms, white blooms, purple blooms. The bushes are covered in them. He can barely see the dark green of any of the leaves. He walks through his effusive flowering design, picking fresh blooms to float in bowls in the house. Flowers in their home remind him of the necessity of appreciating life and beauty. No more sorrow. No more avoiding life or responsibility. From here on out, there'll be a return to the celebration of living. There'll be noise and music and dancing and plenty of loud, tone-deaf singing. There'll be the wholehearted embrace of erratic schedules, conversation interruptions constantly. Most of all, and it's already happening, There'll be the return of laughter, giggling, chuckling, grinning, and nodding yes to almost every single idea that's uttered. Errol and Tony are deep within the spiral. The house cannot be seen. Errol pauses a moment to reflect, to listen, to be aware. He is aware of Tony watching him and his undeserved admiration. He's aware of the crisp, cold weather, of the bright sun blunting the edges on it. He's standing in the midst of so much unbelievable beauty, and he's aware that he loves. He loves his son so much. He loves that big silver-gray pit bull who follows him everywhere. He's aware of the solidity of the fertile earth underneath the soles of his brand spanking new shoes, shoes that are exactly like his son's, except his are silver and Ebby's are green. He's aware he has been offered a second chance at being a good father. His heart beats rapidly and he tells Tony, I won't mess it up this time. Tony leans into him and the two gentlemen stand close, listening to the gentle thrum of the healthy, vibrant life surrounding them. Errol reaches into the inside pocket of his coat and pulls out the last object that was inside the shoebox the one that brought him to his knees and reminded him of his obligation, of hope, and of the most precious thing to ever grace his life. It's small, impossibly small to convey something so huge. His son painted it when he was 12 years old, 
right in front of him in less than 10 seconds. On the two by two inch white canvas is a black line. It starts out thin, then swells, then tapers, then thins again, all the while communicating the extraordinary gifts his son possesses. He remembers Ebby's small hand putting the paintbrush dipped in jet black paint to the tiny canvas. He remembers the look of concentration and delight on his face as he lowered his child's head to begin and finish the work. He remembers the hope of reconciliation in his eyes, his eagerness to please his father, a little boy's quiet effort to draw his daddy back into his family life. Errol wipes away a tear as he looks at the exquisite, uninterrupted line drawing of a tall man happily striding somewhere. The tall man is looking forward with confidence and he's holding the hand of a little boy who's right by his side. There's a hint of a relaxed smile on his face. The boy is looking up at the tall man with total trust. They belong together, these two connected figures. The simple yet infinitely profound drawing communicates so much. In the drawing there is peace, companionship, and integrity. No one on the planet would have believed that an adolescent had executed such perfection and density of feeling. On the left side of the man, there's a thin, undulating black line. Connected to the line is a dog, a puppy, six months old or so. His feet aren't touching the ground because he's dancing and prancing as he follows the conjoined duo. He's unaware that he, too, is connected to this family. Once he'd carefully studied it, Errol recognized that the leash was not actually a leash, but a lifeline binding the three souls together in a meaningful and unbreakable union. It's a union filled with joy and the quiet, perpetual activity of inside-out growth. The Camellia japonica is a tough plant. Anything that we grow down here has got to be tough. We've got brutal summers. I'm talking brutal. Like you get warned. We are we are regularly warned to stay inside on certain days because you could literally die if you get too hot. That that's regular. All right. But the camellia, the camellia can take it. The camellia can take it. Floods, um, uh, freeze. Rain, I mean, you know, anything you throw at it. And this plant, it is spectacular. It's native to Asia, started in China. The largest one on record is 36 feet tall and 775 square feet in uh, circumference or area that it covers. That's massive. That is a massive, massive camellia. They grow in forest in Japan. I wouldn't even know if I could um, handle that. Going into a forest and seeing a bunch of camellias in full bloom. I mean, the camellia, the the the, uh, the blooms are the blooms are stunning, and they're all different. The irrational ex exuberance bloom. It looks like a, it looks like a bunch of different blooms. They look totally different at certain at certain times when they're blooming. You don't believe that this one plant, you're thinking, how does that plant have these blooms that look totally different from one another, yet there they are existing, and they're glorious. They're glorious. I can't even begin to describe how exquisite the Camellia japonica flower is. And why is, there, there, why is that? Because they're big. I mean, these the, the, the bloom... It does not communicate frailty. These are these are strong-looking blooms, and some of them are as big as your hand. One bloom is big as your hand, and they're all, you have all these different blooms. I mean, some of them have what? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six petals, and some of them some of them look papery, but they still they still convey strength, and they're all and they have all these colors. Oh my gosh! And then some of them look like they're th there's this one. I think I have it. Yeah, it's the Edna Campbell. It's red and white, and it looks it looks like it's bleeding. Oh my gosh, it's so gorgeous! And you can when when the camellia is blooming, you can do exactly what Errol. You can you can cut the blooms, 
put them in a I would put them in a white bowl. It looks gorgeous, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The bowl uh, is going to disappear. Nobody's going to notice the container. They will float. Um, uh, two weeks. Oh my gosh, those blooms they last. They last forever. And you never get tired. And you never get tired of looking at them. You know how some flowers you bring inside. And they're blooming, and you're going, uh, when is that going to uh, wilt? Because I'm sick of looking at it. You, you never, ever do that with a camellia bloom. They're too, they're too potent. They are too potent. And, they have, and the dark green leaves, dark green leaves are, they're, um, they're kind of big, shaped like a, like a what? Shaped like a spade, you know, the spade in the cards, the suit of cards. That's what they're shaped like. Sort of, they're a little bit, they're rounded and dark, dark, dark green. Oh my gosh, and, we, and they take forever to grow. They are the slowest growing things. I mean, that's the only thing that's daunting about them. And people aren't planting them anymore, to tell you the truth. They're not planting them because they're so slow growing. So, I mean, I've got them in my yard because I just love them, but <laughs> it is, I mean, they're little bitty plants. But they're, even though they're little bitty, and they got one in the backyard that's two feet, two feet tall. And that thing right now has got, what, six buds on it, fat buds. And they're show-stopping. I mean, Camellia japonica, that's a show-stopping bloom. Get real. It is. But I love them. I love them all. And some of the blooms, like some of the white blooms, some of the pink blooms, they're tight. You wouldn't believe how tight they are. That's the only way I can describe it. And, the, and so many petals, like I'm looking at one right now. Oh, gosh, so many petals. They just are beautiful. A, a, and it's amazing that the flowers are so, so, so very different. It's a substantial plant, a serious plant. And, you know, we don't, we don't fertilize them around here. We don't, we don't have to really fertilize anything. Well, we can if we want to, but the dirt we have around here, y'all, in Louisiana, in the south, it is extraordinary. I mean, the dirt we have, even our bad dirt is extraordinary. You can plant anything in it, and it'll grow. It truly will. My yard is witness to that because I got some terrible dirt. I couldn't believe a terrible dirt. And I just chew it in the ground, boom, stuff grows. Thank you, Louisiana. Ebby, Errol, and Adelia. I'm going to tell you what they look like. Ebby is tall thin and he's a six foot tall errol errol is almost six feet tall probably five ten or five eleven and his body is like you know that uh the lego the little lego men the stocky square bodies that's what he looks like stocky strength when you see errol you think strength solidity Sure-footedness. When you see Ebby, you think he's going to fly away. He looks slight. Like he could. He looks very light. Adelia. Adelia, she did not look like anything special. You know? She really didn't. She was not a great beauty. But what was captivating about her was her spirit. It just, she exuded life and love. Adelia loved, and she loved those two men. I'm not kidding you. She loved them. And Ebby, you want to be mad at Ebby for knocking Tony in the head, but just think about, just think about what Ebby, I mean, at five years old, his mother died, and bam, you know, uh, affection, praise, attention, it, it, it was cut off. And this was a child who, remember in that scene where Errol is, they're snuggled up on the floor when they first moved into that house, and they're snuggled up on that air mattress. I don't know if you ever slept on an air mattress, but you don't want to move around too much because you're paranoid you're going to stab it and blow all the air out. So you move slowly. So Errol, he's got that little boy cradled, one-year-old little boy cradled in his arms closely. He loves that child. And so that's, I mean, that's what Ebby, Ebby got until he was five years old. There was so much singing and dancing in that house, laughing and giggling. 
And then it was gone. No warning at all. One day there was life. And the next day there is silence. And the silence stays. Cats are gone. There's nothing in there but those two men. And they don't know what to do. They have no idea how to navigate. You know? I mean, Errol only thinks of practical things. I mean, he's a bus driver. Think about it. He drove buses for 30 years. And then he goes on to, when he retires, he is doing small engine repair. Not, and they live, this is in the South, where we got any kind of engine you want from anything from a push lawnmower to the biggest engine that exists on the world. We got, listen, we got machines around here. This is a rural farming community. So we got we got big machines. And so, uh, but he is a bus driver for 30 years. He's punching a time clock. That's what he's doing. Staying steady. Or he thinks it's steady. That's not steady doing that. It's not. Thinks he's winning. He doesn't know. He doesn't know how to do life. He really doesn't know. He's just planting those camellias. He is planting those camellias one after the other. Like in a fugue state, you know? And thinking honestly that he, he's, he's doing what he's supposed to do because he's paying, he's feeding the child, clothing the child. But, you know, he's so grief-stricken by the loss of uh, Adelia. I mean, Adelia is the true irrational exuberance in their lives. And then he gets that kid, Ebby, his son, who is ten times the irrational exuberance that she ever thought about being, that little kid. Ebby. He needed somebody to help him. We all do from time to time, don't we? And nobody was there, you know? And nobody was there. His daddy thought he was there, but he wasn't. He just keeps on trucking. Day in, day out. Driving the bus, repairing lawnmowers, planting Camellia japonicus. This stunning and unique plant that is legendary for being slow growing. And then comes Silver Tony. Life. You know, you never know. You never know what life is going to bring you. A companion animal. The dog. In my estimation, the pit bull is the perfect companion animal. I mean, that dog is perfect. I've got one, and I've fostered a ton of them. Every single one. I'm talking every single one. It's just, just amazing. I mean, I don't know, amazing is not the right word, but they're just too cool, right? I mean, they're happy, golly, Pitbull's a happy dog. And surprisingly docile for being such a big dog, being such a muscular beast. Because the Pitbull is a very powerful breed. That dog is, a, that dog is one of the strongest dogs that I've ever seen in my life. Every single one of them. I have seen, and they are prone to laziness, beware. They're prone to, the pit bull is prone to laziness. And they don't bark. They do, they're not barkers. Pit bulls are not barkers. Maybe if some of, maybe one who's neurotic got somebody out there. Mine is, well, I don't know what the background of that dog is, but every pit bull I ever met, they're not barkers. I, the pit bull, when I have, if she barks, it's, it's something, something is happening and I need to go look outside or pay attention to my surroundings because she doesn't bark. I have seen her. The one I have, she's not. T Tony is long-legged. He's one of those long-legged pits. The one I have is short. She's a chunky one. 
she probably looks like more more like the original pits you know the original pits didn't they weren't they weren't there weren't all these varieties you had the, the original pit and probably r the the face was more bulldoggy more bulldoggy face but they were stocky like mine not long legged like tony and now of course we've got all these pit bull breeds but uh, they're cool i have seen her jump effortlessly i mean i'm talking like she was uh, taking a step forward i have seen her jump four feet off the ground effortlessly without a thought with such grace and athleticism that my jaw dropped to the ground because she acts like uh, she can't do it no she can't do it i can't i can't get off the sofa i can't do it i've got to i gotta take it easy i'm tired that's what this one is smart oh my gosh pit bulls are so smart and they have they have facial expressions. They, when you look at them, if you're having a conversation with them or watching them watch something else, look at their, if you have a pit bull, watch your dog's face. I'm telling you, the, the facial muscles move in the pit bull's face and it has facial expressions. I don't know one thing bad to say about a pit bull. I'm not kidding you, except that they're, I mean, they're, they're powerful. They're very powerful. That's the only, that's the only thing. And I mean, that's not negative. That's just saying, beware. So what, what do you, what I mean by that? What if you, I mean, you got a powerful breed. Well, for one thing, they're going to knock you down. They're happy dogs. God, pit bull. You talk about a happy dog. Oh my gosh. They are so happy all the time. Their face, you know, it looks like they're smiling, that pit bull smile. God, that's the best thing. That's such a beautiful thing to see. They are happy dogs. Smart fun 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 to be around great exercising buddies a powerful dog what do i mean well you just got to be aware if you've got a powerful dog breed you've got to be you've got to be a little bit more aware of the dogs and they're fast amazingly fast pit bulls and they're skeletons it's like they're flexible they, you know, it's kind of like a lab. A lab has that, can move, can move like that and, and be flexible. This one I have, you wouldn't believe she can, I've seen her move to so much. She, she looks like, she can move like a pretzel. You would never, ever think that looking at her because she's so muscular. Because by now, you know, my dogs get exercised. I mean, they do. That's another thing you got to do with the pit bull, those big breeds. Any of them, any dog actually. But if you got a powerful breed, what what are powerful breeds? Like the mastiffs, all the mastiffs, of course, most of whom need to be in the field, garden, um, livestock, and not in the home. Maybe that South African mastiff. I've read about them. That's a powerful. That's a powerful dog right there, boy. It's a powerful dog. You just need to be aware and not and not afraid of your dog. Not afraid. I've seen that a lot. People get a big dog and then they're afraid of the dog. God, pit bulls are wonderful. We breed them with everything. We got pit bull everything. Pit lab. Pit poodle. You name it. I mean, it's pit central around here. Pit German Shepherd. Pit Kerr. I've seen a pit... Catahoula Leopard Cur, and you talk about a gorgeous dog. Oh my gosh! And a little bit easier to handle. If you put a pit in there, that's going to that, that somehow it, it calms it, it calms the dog. But the lab, who knows? You know, I won't, you don't mind that at all. The lab, gosh, lab is a wild dog. But yeah, we breed pits with everything: pit possum, pit raccoons, pit squirrels, pit mosquitoes. We just we just get after it around here, and here's how you can tell if a pit has been bred with a squirrel or a mosquito. The squirrel is not as active. You're gonna look up in the tree, and the squirrel is laid out on the branch, not doing a lot of work. The mosquitoes they don't sting so much, and they got a 
tail with a white tip on it. You know, that mosquito's been bred with the pit bull. I'm serious. We, it's, it's crazy, the amount of pit bulls we have around here. I would even go so far as to say it's a little obscene. But it is what it is. And we're figuring it out. It's taking us time. But we're figuring it out. And we're going to make it. But beware. There is something to beware. I want to warn you all about the pit bull. They are professional snugglers. I have never had a dog that was such a perfect snuggler. She is amazing. I mean, snuggle time. Big time. Loves me. I've never. Foster's. They love pit bulls. Oh, my gosh. They love their humans. A pit bull is like having a little kid around. It's like having a five-year-old kid in your house. I mean, they're that, they're that animated, that attached to you, that wanting to be around you all the time. And they're short. They have short hair. They don't shed that much. They're awesome. But you got to exercise a pit bull. If you wanted to get a dog and you exercise regularly and you're going to give the dog attention, you're going to really take care of that dog and you want a buddy to hang out with who's fun, easygoing, quiet, you know, quiet nature. The pit bull is a, is a, a, has a quiet nature. I mean, when they're puppies, they're puppies, all right, come on. But once they... Uh, well, this one I have, she's always been chill. She's uh, and the ones I've fostered, they have been super chill. I mean, get a pit bull. Our shelters are overflowing with them, so uh, that's not a problem at all. Good-looking dogs. I love those blocky heads. I love that pit bull smile, and they really do. They smile, and they love everybody. You talk about a friendly, friendly dog. God, they're friendly. But they're big dogs. They're big dogs. I mean, what is a dog? You got a dog as a live animal. What does that mean? It's unpredictable. You got to be on your toes about any animal you have in your house. Like I'll tell you. This one I have, she had an unfortunate beginning and uh, was deprived of food. So she's got a little bit of a food thing. And so I have to watch when I feed them because there can be a little scuffle. If I'm not watching. But then one gentle, hey, 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 and it's over. And it's over. Oh, my gosh. Because the pit bull, I'm telling you, the pit bull, I've never had a dog that has loved me like this dog loves me. And she's, I am this dog's world. I am, I am her, her world. I mean, I love that dog. I love all my dogs. But this one, there's something special about her. And I don't know... If she is like this because of what she endured at the beginning of her life, I don't think it is. I think she was just made that way. And, and all the pit bulls I've ever, I've ever had in my home were like that. Such a comfort. Oh, man, such a comfort. Gentle, docile. They're not aggressive. They're not aggressive at all. I've never had a pit bull that was aggressive. Uh, the black mouth cur will be inside sleeping uh, a sound uh, sleep and a piece of gravel will uh, rub against another piece of pea gravel 300 feet away and this one jumps up, runs down to the gate and mercilessly attempts to make three to four citizens arrest daily. The pit bull is on the sofa, not moving, not even curious, utterly indifferent to the violent screams of her sister. Okay? That's the pit bull. They're cool. And people who have pit bulls, oh my gosh, we love them. You cannot help but love them. It's the wildest thing. It is because they are so affectionate and so loving and kind. Oh my gosh, my dog, she is so thoughtful. And all the fosters I've had, they are so thoughtful and well-mannered. Just darling, darling, precious beast. Give me a pit bull. Give me a pit bull. And all the colors, they come in so many colors. I've seen black. And they all, ha and they all have that, that patch of white on, the, on their chest. Most, most of them do. 
most of them did. They're gonna have a, most of them have white, but I've seen one. Well, it's, I've already seen that the the, uh, the white. There's usually some white. This one I have is a tiger brindle. She's got a, a lot of white on her. Very common looking. There's nothing special about this one. You look at her, she's not. She don't go. Oh, she's gorgeous. No, none of that comes to mind. She's just a. She's a common looking dog, but boy, she's gorgeous in my eyes. She's gorgeous in my eyes. I've seen gray pit bulls, black pit bulls, every color you can think of. Let me see. Yeah, I've seen red pit bulls. Those big blocky heads. That's a good looking dog. Chest and muscle. Oh my gosh. And they, I mean, the the muscle in the chest. That's what, this what mine, her strength. I, I can't, I mean, she uses it. You, I mean, I can't even, you got to see it to believe it. It's chest, what is it, front legs, shoulders, chest, and neck. Oh, strength. And she doesn't even know how strong she is. For example, if I'm walking down the path uh, to my car, and I'll have the black mouth car and the uh, pit bump into me, I barely feel the black mouth car. But the pit, uh, bam, she's knocking me to the side. She doesn't even know it. She's just coming by there, boom. Just that, that, that strength. Oh, God, I love that, too. It's so gorgeous. That dog's so strong. I could just talk about it all day long. The strength of that dog. I once saw, they're funny, man. They're funny. I mean, and they will play at anything. They'll, they'll, they'll play at anything. I once went to a house, and this person had way too many pit bulls. But there was one, and they had this rope hang. I mean, we are barbarians here. I don't know what to tell you. Southern people, we've got to get a grip. And there was a rope hanging from the tree because this is how we give our dogs toys here in playtime. And they had somehow trained the dog, or I'll tell you something, the pit bull figured it out himself. The, the, how high up was that rope? Yeah, that, that rope was five feet in the, um, was five feet above, five feet above the ground. I watched that pit effortlessly jump up and grab that slab of rope and just hang there hang and um swing from side to side he loved it you could tell that dog was so happy doing that i mean they are they they're easy to please they never complain they're happy with anything they just want to be with you if you don't want a snuggle bug you don't need to get a pit bull you want a snuggle bug you need to get a pit bull because you're going to get a snuggle bug. And they snuggle beautifully, beautifully, right up next to your body. No hard edges, no ribs or bones jugging into your stomach or leg. They just mold themselves right to you. And they're a chunk, right? So you feel their solidity, that life force, snuggled up to you, loving you. It's true, I'm telling you, this one that I have, she loves me. Like, I have never been loved by a dog. She's amazing. All dogs are. Their capacity to love, to consider us, to melt into our lives seamlessly, follow us, watch us, protect us. Yes, I mean, I'm, when push comes to shove, yes, this pit of mine will stand up to the uh, challenge. I mean, yeah. All dogs do. A Yorkshire Terrier will stand up to the challenge. I don't know what a Yorkshire Terrier could do, though, in a uh, situation of extreme uh, emergency. But uh, I know what a pit bull can do. And I like that. I like that a lot. I don't know how this story came to me. Silver Tony. I think I saw a silver pit bull. I think I, ta- I saw two silver pit bulls. One was a long-legged one, and one was a fathead. I think that's what they call them, fathead pit bulls. I mean, this head was, it was gargantuan, the head on this. It was ridiculously large. But, oh, my gosh, that dog was, the, they're the happiest, they're the happiest dogs I've ever seen. They are. And they can handle pain. And that's, that's, I mean, boy, they can, they can take it. I mean, you'll look down in the, I mean, 
the car has got a, uh, I don't know, a sticker in her foot, and she is limping as though her leg is about to be broken, or she's twisted her ankle enough to go to the hospital. And the <laughs> the pit will have the same, or maybe 25 stickers in all four pads, and she's trucking along like there's nothing wrong. They have an amazing high tolerance for pain. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, that to me, the pit bull is the ultimate companion animal. Because they're professional snugglers. That's that's the key thing right there. They're professional snugglers. They are short-haired, wonderful. They're funny, funny, make you laugh, make you laugh. And they just adore you. They will adore you forever. I mean, that pit bull, that dog changed Errol's life. Unchained him. They both became unchained. You know, Errol from his grief, Tony from his misery. And that's it. And the pit bull, that's all dogs, man. You, they keep on, they keep on trucking. They don't remember. They don't recall abuse and neglect. Once you rescue them or bring them into your home and shower love on them, they never look back. There's no, I mean, maybe if it's extreme, okay? And y'all know what I'm talking about. If it's extreme, of course. But, yeah, but they're big dogs. And you got to exercise a pit bull. I mean, do right. Come on, we got we to gotta do right by our dogs. We got to do it. Because you know what? They always do right by us. I'm glad that y'all listened to me today and this beautiful story of this silver pit bull and these two men who found their way back to one another and to life. This is one of my favorites. I love pit bulls, though. So to write about a pit bull was, God, what a joy doing these things now. I see y'all listening to me. I imagine y'all listening to me. Getting y'all to think about dogs. I hope y'all are thinking about dogs. And how wonderful and amazing, multifaceted, gorgeous, cool, golly dogs. I can't live without them. Cannot live without a dog. There's no way I ever could. I just couldn't. They bring too much to your life. And the more that I'm, you know what's curious? The more that I'm around them and the more that I'm doing, that I'm writing about them and then doing these podcasts. Oh, what a lovely thing it is, you guys. Because the revel, the revelation of dogs, it is intensifying and I'm noticing more and more about about the dog, about how we or I treat dogs, what they bring to our lives, but also their limitless capacity to love, their intelligence. Oh my gosh, this pit I have, she is so smart. She is so smart. I love her. And a gift, she is such a gift to my life. All my dogs are. And I chose each and every one. They were a deliberate choice. I made the choice to keep them, to take responsibility for them. And being from the South, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm still pretty ignorant. We got a long history of not knowing how to treat these animals. And I learn every single day how to do better by them. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It's totally rewarding. Thank y'all for listening. I love y'all listening. Appreciate it so much. This has been Dog Food with Catherine Abel.